Blog Talk Radio.
Mm-hmm. Well, hello, 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 hello out there in Blog Talk Radio land, honey. Hey there, precious pumpkins. How y'all doing out there? It's another glorious Wednesday, honey. You know what time it is. I hope you have all your crumpets together, baby, because it's time to dish tea. And you're dishing tea, darlings. Ha! With Big Meach. Hey, people. Oh. First off, let me say this right now. As glorious as this Wednesday is, Big Meach is a little under the weather. You guys know I've been um, forthcoming with you about um, my health issues. And you guys know I had this big old hernia on things and this, that, and the other. But today, it is really, really, really bothering me. So as we go on through the show, you may hear me grunt. You may hear me get a little dis- sound a little disheveled or whatever. And it's causing me to be a little bit gaseous. So I'm hoping I don't sit up there and be just all rude and burp and carry on. <laughs> All in the day of interview, honey. However, I just want to guy I, I know I'm real, so I'm keeping it real like that, so that you guys will be will understand today. Yeah, honey. Last night at the donut factory, honey, it kind of got I got a little stressed out, and uh, yeah, this one all this really started happening. So right now we're just going through, letting it run through its process, and you guys already know that the process is sandpaper for the soul. So, yeah, so that day is going to be me today, honey. But I got enough fire fire and fever in me, baby, because, honey, today is going to be a real, 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 real cute show, honey. So I hope you got your cups ready, all your teacups, because we got a good old hot pot that we are ready to dish, okay? Now, before we get into all of that, honey, let me say thank you to all of you out there who who makes things happen for me. If you're listening by computer and would like to join in on the conversation or have questions or comments for our guests, please feel free to call in at 347-205-9183. That's 347-205-9183. If you want to say something, press the number 1, and on my call queue will show me that you, your hand is up and you have something to say. I am so sorry. Usually my tea room is open right about now, but apparently, because I have this damn thing going on with my computer, it won't open over here. So I have to find out what glitch is. I know what the glitch is. I had to get a new operating system or something. But um, the damn tea room won't open, so I can't get in there today. So you guys won't be able to dish over there like we usually do. However, it's okay. Just make sure you're listening by computer and come on in and do your thing that way, okay? Um, I'm going to take my time right here, and let me say my disclaimer now, because as y'all, y'all heard from the top, honey, okay, I'm under the weather. Y'all know, honey, I don't know what bag I'm coming out of. Just know I'm coming out of one. So, dishing tea with big meat is for mature audiences and the language and or subject matters are not appropriate for children or anyone who was not mature to handle the subject matters. So, your listening discretion is advised. Again, Dishing Tea with Big Meech is for mature audiences, and the language and or subject matters that you hear are not appropriate for children or anyone who is not mature enough to handle the the topics. So, your listening discretion is advised, honey, okay? For those of you who are new to me, honey, you're going to learn very quickly that um, I have a potty mouth. I make no excuses for it. I've earned it at 42 years old. Every four-letter word or colorful or colorful quip that comes out of my mouth, honey, I've earned the right to say it. So if you're at work or if you have children around, I ask you to govern yourselves accordingly, and act responsibly, okay? If you're at work, this is the time now to put your headphones on and or turn your volume down to a respectful level. Uh, this is the time also for you to get your children, honey, and go ahead on and put on Dora or Barney or somebody for them so they can be entertained while you're entertained here, okay? And, uh, yeah, so, hey, I'm not going to sit up there and allow any of you bitches to to call me, write me, email me, text me, 
send up smoke signals about anything that you may have suffered because you did not govern yourself accordingly. You understand? So you consider yourselves warned at this time. <laughs> now, for those of you who have questions, comments, concerns, show ideas, um, our potential guest, if you wish to, to uh, come on as one of the sponsors, please feel free to go to our website at www.dishingtea.com. That's www.dishingtea.com, or email me directly at bigmeach at dishingtea.com. That's bigmeach, B-I-G-M-E-A-C-H, at dishingtea, like the drink, T-E-A, dot com, Okay. Now, all right, without any further ado, yes, okay, here we go. I'm going to allow you guys to to come into this particular world. And um, when we come back from the other side of this break, I want you guys to really, 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 really sit back because I affectionately titled this show The Master of the Elements. A conversation with Mr. Larry Dunn. Now, for those of you who don't know who he is, honey, I compare him to Thor. I compare him to Storm because this man has been the musical director and one of the founding members of the group Earth, Wind, and Fire and has been just the master behind some of the most wonderful pieces of music ever in history. Okay, and just like, you know, the weather controllers, honey, he was able to sit down and take all of those elements, honey, and blend them together for beautiful harmonies, sensational sounds, and darling, we have what we know to be a legacy of music. So today we're going to be talking with him. Now, before I bring him on, like I said, let me go on the flip side, take a break right here so that I can get something to wet my palate. And then we're going to move forward, and when we come back, outside of my voice, the other voice you will hear will be that of Mr. Larry Dunn, the master of the elements, okay? So I will talk to you in just a few moments. Trig Laboratories manufactures premium sexual wellness and consumer health care products and is the parent company of Wet International Incorporated, one of the world's best-selling lines of personal lubricants and intimacy products. We carry a large variety of personal and flavored lubricants, flavored heating massage lotions, and aromatherapy heating massage oils. Whether you need a little or a lot, Wet has you covered. Our line of high-quality, innovative, and unique products are formulated using only the finest ingredients at our FDA-approved facility, meeting the strictest manufacturing standards. Wet is available worldwide at specialty stores and online retailers and at pharmacies nationwide. For more information or to find a retailer near you, Log on to www.stayswetlonger.com. Trig Laboratories. We create fun, quality, trusted products to innovate your intimacy. Trey Davenport, also a very proud member of Le Troupe des Arts, calling to wish Demetrius, as well as Dishing Tea with Big Meech, a very happy congratulations for your third year anniversary. Keep doing what you do. You are a beacon in the media community. As a publicist, I've always looked to your show to give notoriety, acknowledgement, um, and awareness to my clients and their topics. 
ranging from NFL players to music artists to up-and-coming actors and actresses. Dishing Tea with Vic Meech has always been my go-to place for that platform. You are awesome. You are not afraid to uh, broach topics that need to be discussed and to always keep it 100% real and from the heart. So with, from trade day management and publicity and from a longtime friend and loved one uh, from many, many years, I just wanted to tell you how much I love you and how I appreciate Dishing Tea with Big Meech. Love you. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Yes, yes, honey, and we are back. All right now, all right, all right, honey. Did you like that groove? Did you like that? That was called Brazilian Dream, honey, from the Lover Silhouette uh, project. That was the first solo project that uh, Mr. Dunn had taken on. So uh, without any further ado, honey, let's get into the musical soundings and the master of the elements himself. This is the one and only Mr. Larry Dunn. Hello there, Mr. Dunn. How are you today, sir? Hey, Beach. How you doing? Oh, baby, I could be better, but I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> You're going to be all right. Yeah, it's all good. Okay, listen to you coming up in here with this old deep old voice. Now, now Louisa, get them, girl. Okay. <laughs> How's it going on in your world today? We're good, man. We've just been looking forward to uh, to this. We've heard of quite a bit about you. Oh, really? Oh, well, bless your heart. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? Let's dive into this because for the longest time, I have, of course, like like many, 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 many others, have grown up with the music of the elements, baby, earth, wind, and fire. And having to have been subjected to their catalog of music, you know, it has just been an honor and a pleasure to be, and a blessing, I call it, to be in the same time and the space to experience this kind of music, particularly, too, because I'm an old school head and a lot of cats don't understand the art of music. So let me start you and let's get the folks to get into your journey. And let's start with the beginning on what was it that was your inspiration to get into the music to begin with? Well, actually I started really, really young. I was about two years old in uh, in Denver. Uh, we had a raggedy little upright piano in the living room. Mm-hmm. And my Pops, you know, my, my pop was uh, African American. My mom was Italian, and uh, mm. played upright bass, guitar, and piano. And so when I was about two, I started beating on that thing. When I was about, I don't know, man, maybe four or five, he taught me Blueberry Hill by Fats Domino. Yes. So a lot of the young cats may not know, but you know, it's an American icon. You know, when it comes to, uh, I, I call it American classical music, which is blues and jazz and so I learned that and I just man you know I would just sit in there with or without anyone and just beat on that thing day and night by the time I was about uh, I guess fourth fifth grade I got a guitar and I learned the Beatles stuff and uh, Ray Charles mm-hmm. and also I mm-hmm. think six, about sixth grade you know I wanted to be in the band at school and they had loader instruments because uh you know, you couldn't just tell your folks, buy me this. They'd be like, right, I remember those days. <laughs> oh, you know, uh, which was great for us because, you know, I think a lot of times kids today, they, you know, they, they get to, they ask for anything, they just get it, and it leaves you wanting for nothing. So you have to be thirsty for it. Exactly. So the only instrument they had left was a baritone horn. No, not a baritone sax. It's a baritone <laughs> horn, kind of looks like a miniature tuba. But that's all they had yes. left. Yeah. like and I'll take it. And I used to carry that thing home every day. It was bigger than I was. And then I go to the football games and whip it out and, and play along and just play by myself. You know, and all all the people out there and the girls are like, he crazy. But uh <laughs> you know, I just, I just love music. So I was in the band with that. And then I started playing uh I got a bass, I played that a little bit of that. And then in sixth grade they got me an organ. God God bless them. Ooh. And um uh, Turn the turntable down from 33 and a third to 16. Half wow. Speed. And I would learn all the jazz riffs by uh, my other mentor, Jimmy Smith, uh, very renowned jazz organist. Mm hmm, mm hmm. And my mom, my little Italian mom, God bless her, by the time I was, uh, I'll skip ahead, about 15, she allowed me to play this, these 21 and over nightclubs seven nights a week. Um, oh, wow. So serious. Yeah, I mean, me and uh, Philip Bailey and myself, Hilliard Wilson, uh, I was the youngest one in the band. The other cats were about two to three years older than me. But, man, we, we were serious musicians yeah, at that young of an age. I mean, we were playing everything from The Temptations to uh, to Stylistics to Dionne Warwick, uh, Santana, later on. 
Oh, wow. Uh, the Whispers. Okay. Yeah, I mean, cats like The Whispers would come through, and they were like, who are these young brothers? But, uh, you know, I told, I always tell people, back in back in our day, and I'm sure it was the same in yours, there was only one prereq to be a member of a band. You had to play your ass off. They didn't care That's right. if That's you were right. tall or short, skinny, cute or ugly, black, white, blue, green. You had to, you know, you had to play. Right, and I met Philip when I was about uh, I guess I think I was thirteen and he was fifteen, but prior to that I'd met Harriet Wilson, who is uh, my bass player that's on the album that you got. Mm-hmm. Actually, both of them, and uh, man, I was eleven years old, and then we met Philip because Philip had a band with three great singers, and our band was known for the best instrumentals, so we snatched those three singers up with Philip, and we joined forces, and man, we played all over the, the Colorado area. Oh, wow. Now, that is a very interesting, and here's the dynamic. Now, Philip, being this phenomenal, phenomenal vocalist, and then with this range that's out of this world, what was that for you to be around his particular talent? And then how did you, how was that vibing off of him? Because I could just see jam sessions, and y'all just sitting up there just letting, woo. They were just letting have, you know. Oh, was, what was that in in the early days of developing all of that? Oh, I don't know. No, it was. It was. I mean, you know, like I said back then, even though we were we were kids, you know, it was very serious to us. You know, we would rehearse every day, and I mean, mm. you know, me being the keyboard player, and uh, when we started, when we got to the point where we're at the nightclub. Man, it was wonderful because they had a Hammond B3 organ. Mm-hmm. And there was no way in heaven or anywhere else that I could afford that. I mean, right. the one and the one that my my folks had gotten a little Kimball organ uh, that had gotten torn up because we put it in here. Here, it's mom <laughs> had a janitorial service, so here it would work his butt off, and then uh, she would let him use the van to take our equipment around. Well, there was just, I don't know how many, but too many of the keys on the bottom keyboard were broken and missing. So by the time we got into that club, they had a Hammond B3 organ, their big, beautiful wood Hammond B3. And I remember one night, a couple of nights, I asked my mom, I said, can I stay in there after they close? And God bless her. You know, because at that point, Pops had split, and I was only about 13, whatever. And I would stay in there. I remember staying in there overnight, and I learned blood, sweat, and tears. God bless the child. Me and my friendly turntable. And I remember opening that door at 6 in the morning, and the sun slapped me all up in the head. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but we you know, we would rehearse every day, and you know the cats would come in like, today we're going to learn Promises, Promises. I'm like, what? By Dionne Warwick, which even had time signature changes, where the, the, the time signature would change from 4-4 to 3-4. To 3-4. Very intricate stuff. And then I would create string patches on the organ to make it sound like violins and and we just had a ball man and there was like I said I don't remember any type of you know out of out of line egos or anything like that mm-hmm. G.O. easing got out there was not you know, like I said I don't remember that man and everybody really just admired and cherished every, each other's talent and when we were just we just loved it you know we just rehearsed and we would play and you know all these old women in there like oh I said, hey, I was still a virgin. You know, I, I was yeah. still a... <laughs> okay. My mistress was my music. <laughs> dig it, dig it, dig it. I said, that's, that's something know. a lot of cats don't understand. You know, understanding what the work is, you know, and and really understanding, you know, I eat this, I sleep with this, I breathe it, I inhale it. You know, and this, that, and the other, in order to become the best that I can be. And it comes neurotic and this, that, and the other. But having said that, explain, you know, your discipline in that. Because from a young person, you were able to establish your discipline. What was your discipline like? And how did it affect your personal life at that particular time? Uh, Great, great question. Uh, I was going to say, you know, I would, I love, you know, playing basketball and. And so I know, I know, I made time for that. I did a lot of that, but like I said, a lot of the times I would just I get in that living room, and even at that that age, I get me and my turntable, and and I'd learn that stuff, and I I love the little red light, 
that was on the organ when the, the power light was when you turn it on. And I would even turn turn the, the light down in the living room, and I'd be in there. And even my mom said one time, she said, you know, we never had to make Larry practice. We had to make him stop. Uh-huh. And uh, for me, it was not a chore. You know, it was. that's why I tell a lot of parents today that, you know, if your child is, is heading in that direction, leaning in that direction, the worst, I think the worst thing you can do is force them. It's almost mm. like you have to dangle it. You know, dangle a carrot in front of them. Because I've met so many people on the road, you know, with the fire and different people over the years. And, oh, man, you know, I wish I would have kept playing because my mom made me take lessons when I was, was a kid. And as soon as I was 17 or 18, whatever, you know, I couldn't wait to just not do I hated it. Now I hear you play. I wish I would have kept playing. And so I always tell the people, you know, just don't force it on them. You know, if it's really in them and they really want to do it, you almost kind of want to dangle that carrot and, you know, make it a little, not difficult, you understand what I'm saying, but, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. just make them understand that it, it is definitely a gift. And But I believe that everybody on planet Earth has a gift. Uh, unfortunately, some people never discover what it is. Uh, I think even the worst travesty is people that do know what it is and don't really do anything and about it. And don't know what to do. Right? Know. Yes. But yeah. I believe God's a fair God and that everybody has a gift. And um, But, yeah, I would just practice and practice and practice. And then even that, that served me well as when I became the uh, musical director for EWF when I was only 21. And it was it was a great responsibility, but it was a great feeling because, you know, being the youngest one and having cats like Louis Satterfield and, you know, and Don Myrick and, you know, the, the, the older cast that was in the horn section. And even mm-hmm. more, you know, uh, you know, I was able to uh, not only get their attention, but say, hey, you know, you play Doug A, you play the C, you play the G, and blah, 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 and put together a lot of the great uh, interludes and stuff like that we had. And people don't understand, just like you said, Earth, Wind, and Fire was blessed with some of the greatest musicians. But at the yes, same time, Lord. we rehearsed. And that was a lot of the... Uh, the magic that was Earth, Wind, and Fire. We rehearsed because we wanted to not give people their money worth. We wanted to give them more than their money's worth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so we would rehearse and rehearse. And again, even from way back with Hilliard and Philip and them when we were kids to Earth, Wind, and Fire, consummate professionals, I never got that vibe from any of the cats that walking in and, oh, man, we got to rehearse. Man, we, we're glad when this is over. We Everybody showed up and everybody... And, you know, we really enjoyed and cherished that time that we were able to rehearse and tighten up that show so that when we hit the road, it was like that Bugs Bunny stuff, boy. <laughs> we know it <laughs> heart by heart, you know. Right, 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 right. Okay, well, then, now let's go here and, and let's talk about uh, now here you are as the musical director of the now budding group Earth, Wind, and Fire. You know, you, you're... You guys are are building the name, and you guys are branding yourselves. What was the greatest conflict that you think you had in being the musical director with with such a bevy of talent? Uh, yeah, well, actually, like I said, it, it really there really wasn't a lot of that because. Uh, you know, it was uh, everybody knew what the vision was. Everybody knew what the goal was, and the only we also knew the only way to achieve it. Like people say, man, it, success is, it ain't no big secret. It's in two words. It's like everything you do is hard work. You know, so there was. Now I will I'll be I will be a little bit candid and say that you know there was a couple of points there towards the end of the original Earth Wind and Fire where there was mm-hmm. a little stuff going on and. Well, you got you to gotta understand Larry's half white, so he don't like, wait a minute. My mom just said, don't be telling people I'm white. I'm Italian. Cause <laughs> Italian, right. you know, Hannibal ran up at any rate. So yeah, there was little stuff like that. But, uh, and I said that was towards the end. You know, in, in any in any family, you know, be it, you know, an actual immediate blood family or, or even like with, uh, you know, my wife is Puerto Rican, Cuban, and French. And we talk about time to time how the ignorance of of uh, prejudice in uh-huh. all forms and manner, you know, like the light skins don't like the dark skin sometimes, and and right. the white Puerto Ricans 
the, the white Puerto Ricans with the green eyes didn't like her because she was brown skin, uh, didn't have green eyes, you know. And so ignorance prevails to this day when it comes to that. People exactly. against this type of you, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Exactly, exactly. Okay, now let's go here. Of, mm-hmm. That was about it, you know. Like I said, musically, not a problem. Okay, cute. Then let's go here because now that we have established that everyone is talented, everyone is there for the for the for the common goal. You had your mission statement, your vision statement together, and everybody was on board. Now, you guys went to go sign your first record contract, and now you're recording artists, and you are technically in the business. What were any of the changes that you noticed? And then what was your greatest lesson you learned here in the business we call show? Well, I remember listening to a, uh interview with Jimmy and Terry about mm-hmm. yeah, it was been like 15 years ago or something. And they were telling the people young and old alike that, hey, man, you know, this, this thing that we're in is called the music business. And they said, the thing is, I want you to pay attention. There's two words in that equation, music and business. And so I tell people as well that, you know, learn about the business. Because I remember remember at 19 years old, uh, Al McKay and Maurice were seeing eye to eye a little bit. Mm -hmm. And Al had actually been in the business, the business, before us Denver cats, me and Andrew and Philip, you know. Okay, um, okay. Al had actually, he played with Sammy Davis and, you know, in Vegas, and he also played with uh, Charles Watts, 103rd Street Rhythm Band. Oh, wow, actually, okay. Al actually, Al actually brought a newspaper clipping that I guess he had sat in or played with James Brown at one point, and, Jay, and it was a newspaper clipping, big, big letters that James Brown declares Al McKay funkiest guitarist ever. I'm like, you go, boy. But, oh, yeah, right. so he had a little bit more experience. About the business, I remember when I was 19, and he told me, he said, "Man, you know, if we pull together and and go go up against Maurice about this business stuff, man, you know, we can nip it in the bud." And I said, "You know, man, I, I don't, I don't even care about money, man. I just love music, man, and plus, I think Maurice is a nice guy." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm not saying that that wasn't the truth either, but you know. Like I said, right. it's like in any family, there's going to be uh, likes and dislikes and uh, agreements and disagreements or whatever. But, yeah, you know, there was definitely a lesson in uh, in, in business. And then I also remember stuff like I remember when we, we had Bill Witten, great brother, man, that he passed mm-hmm. away years ago, but mm-hmm. started doing our, our uniforms, our clothing. Okay, okay. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be frugal. I'm just going to give me a couple, uh, two or three that are the bomb, you know, and he, he, he man, that, uh, that boy could sew. And it was a bomb. And then I realized a few years later that Maurice and Verdine, some of the cats had gotten like five, ten, whatever, beautiful thing. And then at the end of the day, they just split it down the middle. I'm like, get the front door. <laughs> you know, so a little stuff like that. You know, you learn. And then uh, I remember when we, like I said, when we did, uh, we got signed by Clive Davis. And uh, mm-hmm. man, I was only, because I was only 17. I actually just turned 18 when I flew out here to play with Earth, Wind, and Fire. And uh, we didn't have a record deal at that point because Maurice had the older cats from Chicago. And, you know, brothers like Tom Jones and Herman Johnson. And in 68, mm-hmm. they all, all changed their names to Mohim Wadabit. And, you right. know, ah. the and the froze, right. you dig? That that was the movement. And for some reason, they uh, said they didn't trust Maurice, and they all they all quit. That was when they had Whoa. Wade Fleming and Sherry Scott and and uh, Donald Whitehead. And uh, they had two albums, like I said, on Warner Brothers. They had mm-hmm. Earth, Wind, Fire. Second one, Earth, Wind, Fire, and Need of Love. And uh, they were all in, they were in L.A., and they all quit and left Verdita Maurice in a hotel room just going, what the hell just happened? Oh, and, wow. Uh, there was a bunch of, re- they had to regroup and regroup. They went through tons of musicians and keyboard players and blah, blah. And then, like I said, they they ended up with what I call the original nine. 
there was, you know, Maurice Burdine, Philip, Freddie, Andrew, myself, Elma K, Johnny Graham, uh, and Ralph Johnson, the original nine that actually went on to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But, yeah, it was 1971, though, when actually Clive Davis, he flew out, had his boys with him, had his white shoes on, and we played for about 45 minutes. And the next thing we knew, Maurice called two days later and said, we, got, we just got signed to Columbia. And Maurice used to say, he said, now, you know what? I'm going to sit back and watch each of you cats change, you know, because sometimes, you know, you start believing your hype. And, you know, things can not be the way they're supposed to be. But, and you, we did see that. I mean, in, in, some, in some, some form or another, you would see that a little bit. But, again, I don't think it was anything on that tip that was outrageous. It was mostly discrepancies within the, within the business. Okay. You know, at the point okay. where we were doing. Go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm no, saying, okay, just co-founding we you. Mm-hmm. Uh, the point when we were, uh, the All in All album, which to me was the pinnacle. I mean, we, that's the way the world was, of course, a big jump off. And then uh, All in All, because that's after Charles Stebney had passed. And mm-hmm. I remember we were doing like two nights at the Spectrum and two nights at Madison Square Garden and stuff like that. And um, we were the first group to ever play the Spectrum and sell it out. And a, a group of color where there was not any incidents because they would have, you know, Bruce Springsteen, whatever, and they'd have stabbings, whatever, and then people couldn't understand it because that what that was how deep the music was. We had Orientals, right. we had whites, the Spanish, we had blacks, and nothing but that music. And then at the end of the day, years later, we you start going through that about why you should learn the business is that we were the biggest group on planet Earth. Damn near. I mean, you know, you got the exactly. Stones or whatever they call us, the Black Beatles. But way back then, we were really not making it anywhere near the type of money on the shows that people thought we were. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, and that that's where that battle started coming in, and then when Al McKay split in '81 and all that, because of that. Now I said for myself, thank God that I was musical director. That I and I, I didn't get a penny more for that either. But mm. that I was one of the main composers because that catalog, like uh, our manager, Jay King, God bless him, uh, had told me years ago, he said, man, that catalog's going to get even bigger. I'm like, no. Nah. But, you know, Jay, uh, if you know Jay, Jay knows that business better than most attorneys. And absolutely, that's one of the biggest catalogs, so praise God for that. But on them live shows, no, it really wasn't. Uh, really? Not that? Oh, wow. Now, let me ask this, because usually when I ask entertainers this particular question, there has always been, like, something going on with the publishing, making sure you're up on your publishing, making sure you're up on your publishing, particularly for songwriters and composers. When you learn that lesson about making sure uh, you, you, you are all legit and this, that, and the other, what was that for you when you start to see the fruits of that? Well, the day late and the dollar short, though. <laughs> yeah, uh-oh, really? <laughs> no, actually, okay. That, 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 see, what had happened was... That's what, what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it's beautiful. Um, like I said, because we were just... Oh, I was 18 years old, so... And I remember I wrote the intro and the bridge on um, Head to the Sky. Uh-huh. Matters, you remember that. Yes. Matter of fact, if it's all right, since people know that we we didn't play that, there was no such thing back then as as sampling at any rate. Exactly. I was. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, you don't mind if I play a little bit? Yeah. You better do what you want to do. I think do. I was only eight, and I, I it just hit me. I said. Piece of music. 
Oh, man. And then, you know, I said, I ate ran to the store, you know, back then, Tower Records. And we would always buy, you would buy the, the album, so you could rip it open, and the album was big, 12, right. 12, 12 inches. So you could see your name. I want to see my name. Like, <laughs> yeah. You'd see your name, and then, then you'd buy the cassette so that you could listen to the cassette in the car. In the car, or, right. Or in the ghetto <laughs> and, uh, right. you know, I, I couldn't wait. I got in the car, and I ripped it open. And it said, Head to the Sky, composed by Maurice White. Oh. Now, granted, you know, he did write the melody and and the beautiful lyrics. and the, But I, I was like, damn, but I wrote the the bridge and the intro. But, I, but you know what? There was no stress. I didn't trip it. I said, you know what? I'm 18, and there's plenty more where that came from. And, yeah, actually, so it did get that point. Like, by the time we got to uh, Be Ever Wonderful, you know, running. So that was, you know, spirit. That was Maurice White, Larry Dunn, 50-50. But the first eight years, because, you know, this was kind of, I don't know, probably the same today, but, well, no, maybe not. But back then it was pretty common that when, you know, you were just getting into it and you were young, the head honcho would, you know, they would take the publishing. Mm. So that was, it was very privy information. That was one of the problems that had occurred with the down spiral of Earth, Wind, and Fire as we knew it with the originals because Maurice got the publishing for the first eight years. But we had really? so, so many great songs and hits that, you know, the, the, the money from the writers wasn't too shabby either. But most right. people who know, don't know, the publishing is like a time and a half more than, than the writers. So if the writers was $100, then the publishing would be $150. Exactly. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think two hundred fifty dollars, something like that. So publishing is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But so what? So what happened was when we did the the Faces album down in Montreal, yes. George Martin Studio, uh, Philip and Al McKay got their attorneys to say, "Hey, you know, hey man, the jig is up. Reese, you a great pilot." But you also have a wonderful Learjet to fly, who is your band, you know. So come on, let's let's you know share and share alike. It's time to release that publishing. These cats have earned it, and so if he did. He gave it to me, and I never said anything. When they say jump, I just said ha ha. Would would y'all? Okay. Do? So at that point, on the face of the album, everybody, me, Philip, Al, everybody, we got we started getting our, our publishing. But then I oh, think what wow. happened was. I think what happened was Maurice kind of felt, I wouldn't say threatened, but I, I don't think he was really that happy that, you know, the Cats made that move, which, you know, I don't think was out of line at that point after eight years. And so I think, you know, it's like he's an older cat. Like, you know, I'm going to start, I'll show him. I'll start writing with David Foster. I'll write with these other cats, which he had to give them their publishing at any rate. Right, and, right, uh, right. And I, uh, the, the sound started going away. You know, it wasn't Earth, Wind, and Fire. And like when we did that uh, Electric Universe album, you know, and I was working mm -hmm. closely with Maurice. I, I told him because they decided not to use the Phoenix horns on that a horn section and and brought in some other cats, you know, with keyboard and synth stuff. And I said, man, I've been doing synth stuff from the beginning. I was one of the premier synthesizer guys and. I said, I'm going to tell you something. You are not going to get that vibration that you get from a Lewis Satterfield, Don Myrick, and Michael Harris, and Romley, and a real horn. So you ain't going to get that from no keyboard. And I said, yeah, I'd be one of the first ones to tell you if we could. They said, well, Larry, you know, we can, you know, we can just get a couple of keyboard players. That, they don't have to be seen. We can put them under the stage. I said, look, if you could get four keyboard players, you can put them right next to me. That is not the issue. The issue is... You're not going to get that. And like Verdine said, with the drum machine, there ain't no plasma in there. So there's yeah, that's right. that you're not going to get. And I told him when we did that Electric Universe album, I don't know if you ever had that one, but I said, Reese, I took it home that night after you finished. I said, came back the next day, and I told him, I said, man, good music it is. Earth, Wind, and Fire, it ain't. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's, so, so that, that's some stuff that not many people know, but... I've heard so much about you and your listeners, and I just, you know, I think you guys are 
people need to know some some of the truth. Like I said, but it's it's all still good because that music, the the real the real music, lives on. Exactly. Okay, let me let me press pause right here. I'm gonna take a little commercial break, but I'm gonna leave you with this. Um, because as the music started to change and and we got more into more of the electrical synthesizers and and more so doing away with the band and more and becoming more computerized, what was that for you in the dynamic of the change, and how were you able to sustain yourself? Think about that, and we're gonna take a commercial break, and we'll be right back on the flip side of this so. Okay, let me go there. Pharaoh's Treasure Box. Fine art, unique jewelry, and sensational 3D silk floral arrangements. Creations by Taps. For all of your decorative needs, contact Pharaoh's Treasure Box at 248-688-5178 or 5179. Again, that's 248 248- 688-5178 or 5179 or you can email at Pharaoh's Treasure Box at yahoo.com that's Pharaoh's Treasure Box P-H-A-R-O-A-H-S Treasure Box at yahoo.com to see the collection or to purchase go to www.buysellcommunity.com forward slash store forward slash Pharaoh's Box Again, that's www.buysellcommunity.com forward slash store forward slash Pharaoh's Box. And that's P-H-A-R-O-A-H-Z Box. Pharaoh's Treasure Box of Detroit, Michigan. Fine art, unique jewelry, and sensational 3D silk floral arrangements. The Internet Sensation is now in print. Get your copy of the book that will not only change your life, but change your thinking as well. Awakenings, Epiphanies Along a Spiritual Journey is a compelling collection of blogs that have been the pinnacle of spiritual development and discernment for its author, Internet talk show host, Big Meech. Not only does this body of work offer the insight from his life experiences, it provides the reader an amazing opportunity to go on a journey that will awaken insight into their own higher power while encouraging personal growth and spiritual development. With chapters such as, I cannot give you life, nor can I live it for you. Truth is a bad bitch. It's time for a career change. I am not your God. And in what love do you operate? You will be captivated and compelled to take the life lessons the book has to offer and apply them to your life. To get your copy today of Awakenings, Epiphanies Along a Spiritual Journey. Go to www.dishingtea.com or you can find it on the web at www.amazon.com or if you prefer an ebook, find it at www.smashwords.com. Awakenings Epiphanies Along a Spiritual Journey. Are you ready? Are you ready for the journey?
<laughs> and we are back. In case you're just Ooh, joining what's us, honey. Up? Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Do East, East Coast people's too much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Y'all gonna find that music. Oh yeah. <laughs> That piece right there, maybe in my dreams, when I heard it, that just infused me something horrible. I was like, okay, wait a minute, and and it, and it shook me. And everybody who knows me and how I am about music, you know, I'm one who, when it, when it starts to work me, honey, I, I slap myself and I hit myself in my head. I'm like, okay, no, it's working me, it's working me. And see, a, a group of us, if if it's working us too much, and I tell you to turn it off. I mean, just give me a second now. Just turn it off, please. And I, uh, you know, turn. Just give me a minute now. Just turn it off because it's working me. And we have been known to take CDs out of CD players on the freeway and just toss them on the freeway because they want less. I said, "Bitch, oh I Lord. told you." Oh yes, yeah, so you ain't gonna work me like this and then think I'm supposed to sit up here and go crazy like that. Give me a second <laughs> so I can ingest this because it took me too fast and this is one of those pieces. So man, yes, honey. Long time, man. That, man, that boy Ellis Hall. He was singing his monkey butt off. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, you oh. know what they say that that's the way. See, here you go. Yes. <laughs> Right there, right there. Woo! There we go. That's the way, Meach. Ooh, ooh. Right there. Oh, that just went right there in my spine, right at the top of my shoulder. See, oh. Oh, my God. Ooh. See. Yeah, they, just, they just keep on coming. See, I was a kid when you guys were doing the live shows and this, that, and the other. I just knew the music. My parents was always there. They would come home from their concerts and and you know sit up there and do their thing and throw the kids upstairs and then they go do their thing <laughs> and they go. <laughs> so hey, you yes. know what they was doing? They was they was being ever wonderful. There you work at me. Ah, yeah. See, you work, see, yeah, okay. <laughs> I can't be in no studio with you because I've been going to hit you with my shoe for real. Okay. Uh, I'm going to knock you in the back of your damn head, but you better. Uh, yeah, I'll hit you so now. hard, even your name will be swollen. Me. Okay. <laughs> Lord uh, have mercy, but I love it. See, that. Is what I, I really believe that music is just God's perfect language. Okay, it transcends everything. Okay, and that's really, I would say. Well. Okay. Oh my. Okay. See. Oh. Okay. Okay. Let me. Damn. Wow. That was brilliant. Okay. Let me get into my question. The the one I left you pondering. The uh, oh. with the music changing, see, oh yes, with the music changing and going more into this this uh, computeristic sound, you know, and everybody on drum machines, and you know they got the keyboard to do all this electrical stuff. How is it that you're able to maintain your integrity, and what did it mean to you when all of that started to change like that? Well, like I told you earlier, when we I remember, never forget when we were doing, uh, I think it was not even Electric Universe. The one after that was it Rays or Power Light? I think it was Power Light. I don't remember. But anyway, mm-hmm. I had a DMX drum machine, and you know the only reason I had it is because you know I wasn't a, I wasn't a great drummer. I bought me a little cheap set at a pawn shop years and years ago when I had my little studio in Culver City. A little eight track, and you know mm-hmm. I just I, I needed some drums, so I just made myself play them. But then when the drum machine came out, I said, okay, that's great, you know. But I loved it for writing purposes. Then I remember bringing it to the studio, 
and uh, programs will be. And uh, I told Maurice what button to press, or I did it what he wanted. And he's standing there, he's like, man, that that mother, that, that it, it played just like me. I said, Reese, it's, it's just a, you know, it's just a computer. And uh, but Verdine was up on it way back there. Verdine looking, he said, man, that mother ain't got no, ain't got no plasma in it, man. Right. And I okay. remember on the millennium, on the new millennium, they had a big celebration on the East Coast, and Quincy spoke about music. Something I forgot why but he was there, and I remember him saying. The drum machine was a scourge of the 21st century. <laughs> Ooh, okay, <laughs> now, okay. For me, and for me, it's like I, I say this about technology. Technology, in and of itself, can neither be good or bad. I said it's just like the governments of the world that tell, you know, Einstein of today or whatever. You know, he, hey man, we need you. To, we need you to do something. Man. We need you. We want you to create a bomb that will kill the people and save the buildings. And I said, man, I'm, no, I'm not going to do that. He said, well, look, if you don't want to do it, you know, your buddy Meech got the same, you know, skills you got, but you know, you got a little, you got a little edge on it. That's why we came to you first. But if you don't want to do it, then we'll go to Meech. Right. You know, I mean, Meech got, you know, 14 people he got to support, so he's going to do it. You know, doesn't necessarily make you a bad person either. And the same thing when we went to Japan to support that first LDO. We had so many meetings and, and, and different stuff, and they would always ask, Larry, son, what's your feeling about technology? And I reiterated, I said, technology in and of itself can neither be good or bad. I said, example, an old man passes away, and there's a $25,000 Stradivarius violin that's in his trash, and this old derelict comes up and finds it and tries to play it, and the neighbors think somebody's killing a cat. So mm-hmm. does it mean that that instrument is no good? I said, no, it's just that cat don't know how to play it. And it's like right. when it came out with the things, that for me, like the drum machine and stuff, I said, it's a great writing tool. But if you notice on both of my albums, at the end of the day, I put real musicians on everything. But yes, that, again, that doesn't mean that, you know, that the drum machines, you know, they're good for, for certain things. Again, to me, with technology, it always boils down to the heart and the spirit behind it. Yeah, and the yeah. purpose. You know? uh, since, like I said, I've, I've started that years ago. You know, thanks to Charles Stepney, my other mentor, uh, turned me on to the mini moog, and that is my baby because that's you know I'm not really a singer. Then that's how I that's what I used to sing. All mm-hmm. those great solos I was able to do with, on Feeling Blue and and Run In mm-hmm. and on and on the intro of Star. And, you know that that's how I, I sing, and so I would I couldn't imagine my keyboard artistry without that mini mood. And I synthesize like my wife Louisa. She's she's very I mean her ears are huge that she can hear. She's just amazing. She used to tell me, you know, don't forget to put your mystical magical stuff up on there. Right. Because I remember back in the day. I'm sure I'd tell Maurice right to his nose. He knows. We were, I think, uh, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, mm-hmm. and this was like maybe seventy four, some seventy, you know, before even before that. That's the way of the world. Mm-hmm. And the show was over. We just ended, boom, we ended it. And I had me some some of my computer synth going, like some you know some some outer space stuff. And Maurice looked at me, boy, he was like the devil. He was like, people don't want to hear that crazy. Shit. I said, what? <laughs> yeah, but he knew I was he knew I was not happy. But God bless him. He came to my room and just sat there and he said, Man, I'm sorry I went off like that. I said, you know, it's all right. And then here we are, you know, he was twenty, thirty years down the road, thirty years later, you know, he was looking for these other people. You know, uh-huh. trying to find that do that crazy so, you know, like I said, man, it's all about application and, and and with anything in life, I believe 99% of it is predicated and based on concept. Dig that. You know, Dig the, reason, that. the reason that your show works so well is because of the concept that you've created for it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, there's mm-hmm. a lot of people that are talented as, or more than we are and in both vernaculars, but, you know, they're lacking in concept. So without concept, it doesn't matter. Exactly. 
I likes that. You know. I mm-hmm. likes that. Now let me go here because I have been wanting to know the answer to this question for years. The live stage shows of EWF with all of its mysticism, the magic, the the pyramids, you know, the dis- dis- full disappearance and carried on. When you guys were getting opposition from the church, Jehovah's Witnesses, and everybody was saying that was of the devil, that's that, that, you know, ain't nobody supposed to be doing all that, that was crazy, that was this, that was that. What was the mindset of the band? D- you know, did it affect you in any way, or was it, as we call today, you know, the haters just motivating you? Well, you know what? See, the thing was, Maurice, people, let's start with the name. With the name, the name was Maurice came up with that because he was into astro- astrology, and mm-hmm. when he had his chart, when he had his, his astrological chart done, the main, the three main elements in his chart was earth, wind, and fire. So mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's the story that I've gotten, and so that's where he created the name Earth, Wind, and Fire. Now it was weird for me because, you know, I was raised Catholic, and uh, and I told I think I told my mom at one point, you know, I I ain't getting nothing out of this but sore knees because I don't speak Latin. So back then they the Catholic Church. You know what? As 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 I moved on in life, and and just you know, I studied many things. I studied. I did. I studied Jehovah's Witness. I studied uh, Eastern philosophy. I took the pay my money and took the course in transcendental meditation because that's what Doug Henning was into. The cat that was doing some, some of our tricks, a great magician, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and so I studied all that stuff. And then you know what? It was so deep. I was on the bus in in Europe, and this was '75, and we were opening the show for Santana. And I was on the bus, and I was doing that meditation trip. It was so deep. I should have known because, you know, the first day they sell it, they sold it to me like, well, you know, this is not no religion or anything. It's just a, it's just an exercise that you do that, you know, helps you relax and reach your full potential, blah, 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 blah. Right, said, okay. right, right, right. Then you had to pay your money. And then I was sitting against the wall one day, and dude said something, and, man, I could... I could swore, you're not supposed to swear, but I could swear I felt something push me back. And I'm like, if I had a brain, I'd be like, oh, okay. But I'm like, okay, whatever. And then the day that you graduate or whatever, yeah, they ask you to bring a flower and a handkerchief. Okay. And they start to sprinkle some rice and, and talking and then something else. I'm like, uh-oh. But being the you know the person with the IQ in the high single digits, I carried on at any rate. <laughs> Stop. I remember an older gentleman that told me, he said, Larry, be careful with that. He said, because a lot of people start dabbling around with that stuff, and they end up in one of them, one of them places with them white, where they fit you with them white coats. Okay, <laughs> okay. So I'm on the bus in Europe, and I'm doing that. And all of a sudden, I'm, man, it's like I heard God speak to me. I mean, tap me on the shoulder. You know, and it wasn't audible, but I, you know, you know, you know when God is mm-hmm, talking to you, and mm-hmm. he said, "Stop it, just stop it." I said, "Excuse me, stop it." And he told me, he said, "You're going to be on an army base tomorrow in Germany." Because you know, most of you who don't know, you know, when you take a bus in 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 Europe, if you were to go from East LA to West LA, you're in, you're in that same distance. You're already in a different country. So he said, "You're going to oh, be." Wow. In a, an army base in Germany tomorrow. I think I'm a, there's a bookstore there. I want you to go and buy a Bible. So, sure enough, I don't know why or how, but we ended up there. And I went and bought this little Bible. And we started doing some study with uh, Leon Patillo, who's a keyboard player and vocalist for Santana at that time. And it was, it was pretty deep. And I just, and, and plus the thing with astrology, I could just walk up to people and say, man, you're Aries. How did, mm-hmm. how did you know? I said, I don't know. But the thing <clears throat> that kind of got me away from that, I mean, you know, everything has got, it's got its basic little traits and stuff like that, but I personally, I just don't live by it. Because then I started meeting people, oh, are you, you a Gemini? Oh, me and you ain't going to get along. I said, you know what, you're right. Right. <laughs> you're right. Absolutely right, because if you're that stupid, <laughs> you don't know me from Adam, you already declaring that we're not going to get along. We're not. It ain't got nothing to do with a sign. It's got to do because you're stupid. Right, dig that, okay. 
I, I reached a point where, you know what, let me see. The best way for me to know Meech is spend some time with him, and then I'll know really who he is instead of waiting for him to act like a this or a that. You know, and so I just kind of, you know, kind of went the other direction on that. Like I said, there are basic traits and stuff, but, you know, Maurice definitely was, you know, was into into that. And I, I've been told Reese on a couple occasions, I was like, hey, man, you know, how are these young girls that, you know, you're dealing with, how are they going to know more about you than you and the creator that, that you talk about all the time? You know, Exactly. So I just go to the source. But it was funny as hell because we were watching that show, Black to the Future, uh-huh. I recorded. They had a dude over there. He said, "Man, back in the day, man, our church said, you know, we couldn't listen to Earth when it fire." And then they showed Maurice with some horns on his head and a kalimba superimposed and, and floating across the stage. Lord. And then the cast came back. He said, "Well, you know, what we did. We just changed churches." Okay. But you know the real deal with that is like I like I said you know uh, I, I did an interview for Playboy magazine in in freaking Amsterdam mm-hmm. when me and Verdine Verdine and I were promoting one of those albums back in the 80s when Maurice uh, was working on something else he didn't come the other guys were doing stuff so Verdine and I and the road manager went on a on a promotion tour and I was mm-hmm. doing with this dude from Playboy and he was asking me questions like is it too Maurice White is a guru I said man look. And, and and I was talking to this other lady, and she said that all the answers to life is in the earth when the fire out. And I said, wait, slow your roll, player. I said, look, first of all, Maurice is a great innovator, visionary, talent, writer, producer, singer. And he put together, you know, a great band. And Earth, Wind & Fire's real message, and I would say this to all the consummate fans, Earth, Wind & Fire's main and real message is wherever you are in life, Raise. If you're a multi-billionaire and you think you can't do no better, there's something that is lacking in your life. Reach right. for it. Raise. You know, look, look, look to God. Raise. You know, and and that that's the main thing. And I said, as far as all the answers, I said you ain't gonna find all the answers to to life in no album. <laughs> I heard I said, that. That's really what you you know what you're searching for. Then you you know you got to search deeper. I said, but the thing is, the music is a gift. And it does have the, the the music has healing power. Music has power to edify, and that's one of the things I think is missing today. Is that I mean there, there's still some because people say that the young kids they ain't got no. There's still some talent, very talented young people as well. But overall, you know, it's like music is being misused because it is definitely a gift. And I I believe, for me, that it should be used to edify, to uplift, to even if not. Uh, put a smile on your face to evoke emotion and or like you were talking about and or a uh, deep thought, you know, but but something on, on, a, on definitely on a spiritual plane. I don't think it was put here to, to play the dozens, but again, that, that's uh, okay. <laughs> Not to play the dozens. Now that was politically correct. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love it. Okay. I love it. All right. Now let's go here. Because there came that time when it was time for you to do your own thing. And some of the music that I've played have come from the very first solo album of yours. When, what was that decision to say, okay, let me, let me do this on my own. Let me see what, you know, how I can cope and, and this, that, and that. What was that for you? Well, I think, you know, sometimes in life, if you just be still for a minute and let God guide your path, it's just a, an automatic evolution that takes place. Um, I got with my wife, Louisa, in 83, mm-hmm. and didn't really even know that uh, she was musically inclined. And uh, But almost from Jump Start, Jump Street, we started, you know, working on music together. And that was eighty three and that you know, that was right. She was with me when I was actually recording the Electric Universe album. And mm-hmm. uh, so we just started doing music and people say, Larry, when when why did you leave the band? I didn't really leave the band. You know, the what it was after we did Electric Universe, which was number ninety nine with an anchor <laughs> oh, okay. as opposed to number one with a bullet. Uh, 
there was a big hiatus. And, uh, you know, about a year, we hadn't really heard nothing. So Cat started calling Reese, like, hey, man, what's up? And he said, well, I'll get back at you. And then finally, he called a meeting, and a couple of cats didn't show up because they didn't think it was going to be fruitful at any rate. Uh-huh. So, but we went. He just laid out. I said, hey, man, Columbia don't really want an album from us, but, you know, they want me to go ahead and do my solo project. And, I, you know, I supported him. I said, hey, man, I gave my blessing. I said, God bless you, you know. If that's your, in your spirit, that's your time, then, you know, God bless you. And so he did his solo album, and I thought, you know, his rendition of, um, uh, yeah, Stand, thank you, Louis, Stand By Me, was brilliant. But, again, sometimes you got to be careful with remakes because, you know, it actually what it did is it brought back Benny King. And they used oh, his wow, version. okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was, Meech, is that people saw Maurice in a different light. You know, and then all of a sudden they see him on the album cover with jeans on, looking more like Lionel Richie. They were kind of confused. Exactly. You know, and, uh, but I, you know, I thought he did a good job on on the album. But you know, hey man, when you got these consummate Earth Wind and Fire fans, they, there's certain sound and certain stuff they're looking for. And so there was that, that big hiatus, and then in '87, tried to pull the band back together, and uh, you know my. Uh, my attorney that I grew up with and, and some of the business people, they got back at me and they said, you know, it just they it wasn't coming correctly. It wasn't right for me at this time. So I just, you know, I just kept moved on. And in and 88, 87, 88, uh, Luis and I started doing uh, music for Japanese television, man. It was a gas. It was so cool. Oh, wow. Stuff, real high-end commercials like the beers. Diamonds and uh, Mercedes Benz, Mitsubishi Eclipse, Subaru, and we did all kinds of music. Uh, Subaru, we did a straight-ahead opera featuring Luisa and, and our Italian buddy Beppe Cantarelli doing straight-ahead opera. We did uh, another commercial. I forgot that company. For, and uh, we did Nat King Cole Smile. And man, what I love oh, about wow. the Japanese, yeah, the Japanese culture and the European culture is, hey man, they don't care about your paint job or about your skin color, you know, your your age. or you, They didn't have right. a tip on that. You know, and they knew my background coming from the fire that they knew. Hey, man, so we do with this cat, you know, and his wife, we know they're going to give it to us on the highest level. And we just had so much fun doing that because we were able, number one, we could stay home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, you well, you know, because that's, that, that's the, the venue that you're in, do, do everything I did from home. And then they'd send like a demo thing. We want we want something like this. Oh, really? Okay. And we do it. Send it back to them via the internet. They check it out. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. Then okay, you guys won the competition, so you you guys get to do the real deal. Do we do the real deal? Uh, send it to them. Okay. Uh, can you just change, bring up that little bit? Do that. Send them the finished product via the internet. Then they wire the money into your bank via the internet. And a good time was had by most. Yeah, I'll so, say that. Yeah, so you know when that man, that was just a one. That's a wonderful experience. And then you know we went to Japan, and mm-hmm. um, I was also doing these huge concerts with John Mark Cerrone, little French cat that made it really big in the seventies with his disco stuff. And he started putting together these outrageous concerts. I wasn't blown away by the music. The music was, I mean, it was good. But it was more like new age rock opera. So okay, little speaking yeah. for my But the 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 spectacles, man, we did one at the Trocadero, which is that big marble place that uh, mm-hmm. the state was there and actually facing the Eiffel Tower. You can see the Eiffel Tower about I don't know, seemed like a, a mile away. And they had like thousands and thousands of two hundred thousand people between the Eiffel Tower and the stage. And the first one we did and the fireworks, man, it was just, and lasers, and, and but all the music was all, he got all keyboard players. He had myself, he had J.J. from the Art of Noise, he had oh, wow. Lou Weaver, the keyboard player from the Bee Gees, he had Jeff Downs from the group Yes, and it was just brilliant, you know, and so we're doing that. And then he did one of these in Japan, man, where all the, 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 the people that were like the performers, bodies were painted in gold of May, I mean, and then they had fireworks that you can't even see in the United States because they're illegal. And then, oh, wow. Uh, so my buddy, Hiroto Kobayashi, 
a uh, great engineer that goes back and forth from Japan to to the States, was there, and he introduced us to Toru Hashimoto. He said, this is Larry Dunlop. We had a little cassette, gave it to him, and the only thing he said was, can you please f- make sure you feature your wife on something? I said, oh, thank you. And okay, so he did, did this. And it was great. He didn't. He didn't like most executive producers. You know, do this and do that. That's the only thing he said. Please feature your wife, and then uh, uh, you've got. Apparently, you've got it there. So that was '92. And like I said, see, I was so used to just being a member of a band, and mm-hmm. I felt so comfortable in that. I really didn't. I didn't care about. You know, I've, I've never was one to for the limelight. You know, they they put me so far back in the in the stage. I had a daylight bill. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember. You remember when the, the keyboards came out that looked like a guitar you could strap yeah. it on? Yeah. I remember talking to Greg Filling Games. You know, the great guy that did all the stuff for Michael Jackson, great keyboard player. Yeah. And he's like, Larry, man, they got this new thing, man. You could strap it on, man. You could be right up in the front with Maurice Verdine in there. I said, Greg, God bless you, son. <laughs> but uh, okay, I, 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 that ain't me. I like being in the back with all my keyboards and devices and just making it happen sonically, you know. And so it was a little bit of a transition when I had to be the one to be on the mic and talk to the people and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I guess you know I, I can clown. So okay, it, it was see not, there. You know, it wasn't <laughs> really uncomfortable. But there definitely was an adjustment because, you know, like I said, I I never really searched for or did I care much about the limelight, but because of the music, you have to do what you have to do. Mm-hmm. Now, let me ask this particular question, because this EWF was comprised of all men. You guys are on the road, and this, that, and the other. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and all of that that, that the music industry is known for. How were you able to dirge you know, that particular era and not get caught up in it, you know, and and was that something that was a mantra for the group or, you know, did some redevelopment have to come along because folks got caught up and couldn't do what they needed well, to no, do? Well, no, I mean, that was Maurice's thing from the very beginning. Like, you know, we, we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't fart after 10 p.m. <laughs> you know, ah, okay. Which, which, which was... You know, it was really a great, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Help me. It was really a great pattern or whatever. Uh, that's not the right word. But whatever. It was a great. Um, that was your discipline. Uh, what's it? Yeah, it was a great way of maintaining a certain level of discipline. But, you know, you know, true, way back in the, in the 80s, early, I mean, 70s, we were just kids. So there was, there was a couple of us in there that, you know, we puffed a little bit. But yeah. I did not inhale. <laughs> you did. I'm going to hit you with a wet noodle. <laughs> I, did not, I did not have sex relations with women. Uh, so back then, you know, but, you know, I guess just like the scripture says, and when I was a child, I thought as a child. And then, you know, as, as I got older, you know, after through the years, it's like, no, I, I don't even, I don't even really even need that, you know. But no, Maurice, he was. You know, the only thing that, you know, said so we were vegetarians, and and even that didn't last for long because, you know, like, Toby, let's come on, let's be real. You can't be a vegetarian, try to eat vegetables at the holiday year, and when the freaking rug got, probably got more nutrients in it than the vegetables that they put all day. you don't stop be playing. You know what I'm saying? There's a certain way food has to be prepared. You're going to be on a vegetarian diet. So, no, when we finally got to the point, because in the beginning, People got to know it wasn't always like earth, wind, then fire, and limos. And now, and like I tell people a lot of times, a limousine, it reaches a certain point in life where certain things are not luxuries anymore, they're necessity. But in the okay. beginning, you know what I'm saying? In the beginning, we'd fly from LA, from LA to the East Coast, and we'd rent three station wagons, and we'd take turns driving, and we'd drive right. from Philly to from DC to New York, and you get back to the hotel. And you in DuPont, North Carolina, you just praying to God that they might have a machine with a Snickers bar in it and a soda, and there were TVs off. So the only thing you had was hopes of a, a candy bar and a soda and your ghetto blaster in your room. That's it. Hot damn. And okay. that was day when we we were still roommating together before we only one that had a single was Maurice and the, and the road manager. The rest 
rest of us had to, you know, like it, like we was in college. But you know what? It really was like that. You know, we were actually in college because, you know, I I left high school. I only had six months left. Oh wow! So my mom let me go as a city to play with Philip and them, and boy, that was that was a gamble, I guess. But she knew about that music, and King God was so great because I mean, when I was thirteen, and pops had come straggling around and told me I couldn't do a gig, and I was like, "Hey, where you been?" I said, "Plus, I said y'all messed up my life." I said, "You are not taking my music," and he disappeared, and we have seven of us in a little two bedroom house, but he, you know, he had gone. And my brothers were gone because it was me, my older brother, younger brother. And I dropped to my knees and said, God, please help me make it. So one day I could buy my mom another house because I knew she was about to lose the house. Mm-hmm. We had to buy a move to a little two-bedroom duplex with me, my younger brother, my two baby sisters, my mom, my older brother. Wow. Got the house. And, uh, and I said, God, please. And sure enough, when I got my first royalty when I was 19, I went back to Denver and got my mom a house. Okay. And I don't wow. know, what have okay. we learned? Number one, always take care of your mama. Number two, never get a 30-year mortgage. <laughs> uh, 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 okay. <laughs> Dig that. All right, now here, I'm finally going to do something, because we were talking about Louisa and her being featured. And hopefully this thing will download like I need it to, because you guys have done something that has been... Absolutely phenomenal for me. Oh, thank you. Lulu, you're on. <laughs> uh, okay. Hello. Now, Jay, he, he just saying that we've done something that was phenomenal for him, so we about to find out what it is.
Yes. The Twilight World. Hot diggity boom, honey. <laughs> Hot diggity Hello. damn boom, baby. When I heard this, I said, no, he didn't tackle this. Okay. Uh, how and you doing, we, bitch? Hey, Louisa, darling. Honey, your vocals on that are sickening. I love it. And you're so smooth. Oh, sh- you are so smooth and so mellow and so hypnotic. And I'm like, oh my God, honey, this is this is your element of music right here. You know, it, 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 it's just wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It means oh, a honey, lot. I appreciate you, darling, for coming on in and you know being the backbone, honey, of of the Dunn family. You know, because for you to come up to the helm and want to become an integral part, and I, and I stress that, an integral part of the music, darling. I, I, that's, that's just the phenomenal woman that you are, you know, to come in and want to, and, and to challenge this business and then still maintain a personal life with this man. You know, y'all, uh, you go to work, then you got to come home, you know, you got to cook dinner on this, that, and the third, you know, and all those kinds of shenanigans and not necessarily let it get to you. That's me cooking. Larry does all the cooking. Most not all. I do all the eating. Oh well, uh, well that's why you got into the music. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a I'm a cooking mother figure. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> we can both cook. We both get down now. I'm grandma and he's gourmet. That's right. Oh wow. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Oh, well, you know what? Okay, that means I need a plate. Well, maybe not. I got to have his weight loss surgery soon. So, yeah. But anywho, (laughs) you know, let's let's go into the beauty of the second album. Now we're into the journey. You know what? What now is uh, the fever? And the flavor and the message of this particular project, and particularly with all the folks that you're working with, honey, Ronnie, Law, Ronnie, okay, come on. You know, with the folks that you're working with on this particular project, what what is its, its, what is its significance? Well, you know, this was a seven-year labor of love, and like I said, we were so blessed. A lot of people said, how would you get all these people? I said, because they, they love us. You know, they they Dig know it. that. You know, they know we're people of integrity. We're not going, you know. And and I was talking to Jay King, our manager, who's also on the album. Uh, you know, as you know, Jay from Club Nouveau, but this man mm-hmm. he knows more about music law and attorneys and contract than most most famous attorneys. And uh, he kept saying, "Well, man, come on, when when you gonna finish that? When you gonna finish it?" Now we talk. He said, "Man, it was like Larry kept saying, and Louise said." You know, in God's time, he said, because if I if, if they, they'd have finished it when I wanted them to finish it, all this beautiful stuff that we got going on now with the social networking and the people that we know and our networking on wouldn't have been in place. And that's why. Wow. I was saying, oh, okay, God. there. And then the thing is, too, I said, man, you got to understand. You know, uh, again, as Jay says, today is a wonderful time to be working to be alive as a as a not not a bull but a great you know musician. Or artists mm-hmm. because you may you have to do a little bit more work. You have to be a little bit more smart and 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 take care of business. And you can do you can write your ticket. You know it may take a little bit longer, but people have to understand we are the artists. We are the record company. We are the bank. And yeah, well, you know you done. You can call. I don't like calling favors like that. I mean you know we we do barter system. We do some favor. But we always like to make sure that you know we got a a receipt. And, and, and everybody that participated got something, you know, got paid. Because otherwise, you get into that other kind of business that, and we ain't into that. Right. So it took it took a while. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, like I said, the, the thing is, and Lou, Lou, she's she's like I said, she got fifteen jobs, man, and another one on the side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
on top of all that other stuff she do, she got a knack for naming these these albums because she named the first one Lover Silhouette, and then this one too, Into the Journey. And she said it just it just fits because that's that's where we're at, you know, we're continuing into the journey. And mm -hmm. if, if, I don't know if you got the entire piece, but we'll make sure you get it, you know, because oh, there's. Uh, I thought I said, man, we got. You know, of course, Louisa producing with me and writing and singing, and uh, my brother Stephen Dunn doing a lot of the drum work and composing. We got Ronnie Laws, Schubert Laws, James Ingram, B. Lloyd Taylor, uh, Stanley Clark, Foley, Davis. I said, we got enough brothers and sisters up there to make a Tarzan movie. Wow! Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a lasagna noodle right there. Pow! Okay. <laughs> funny, I love, said, I love it. Me, me cheese, funny, ain't he? Oh, he's hilarious. You got oh, it going, boy. Oh, that is the tea right there. Okay. Oh, so now, what now? Um, as this project is emerging, and you have all these different collaborations, you know, and then former collaborations and things, and folks still wanting to work with you and and still wanting to. To uh, you know, live concerts here. You know, have you work here and this, that, and the other. What is it that you, I would, that you would say rather, uh, keeps you grounded so that um, it, it never becomes an ego. You know, you said that earlier that the egos didn't get in the way, but what is it that keeps you grounded so that it doesn't rise up and it doesn't interrupt the flow of the music? I think it's the same for every human being if they just realize, you know, where, 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 what's the source? Where does it come from? Dig that. You know, most peoples and animals and people with an IQ over seven know that it's from God Almighty. So, you know, I tell people, I say, you know what, God is a fair God, and you know, he he doesn't have any more love for or blessings for a Michael Jackson or a Beyonce or or Adele or whoever than he does the person that's living in the street in a box with five children. Right. You know, but the thing is, if you have discovered your talent, you've developed it, and you're able to utilize it to what, whatever its purpose is, to put a smile on people's face, to, to help the poor, to do whatever it is that, that you do with it, <clears throat> I know that God smiles on that. But outside of that, if God ain't tripping on who you are, then why are you? Ooh! So... You better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now go run right? and tell that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like it's, I just it's so unnecessary. It actually, what it does is it, it 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 stunts your growth. It gets in the way of of you doing what you're supposed to do. So it's been that, and and uh, so my relationship with God and my relationship with my wife and of course family. You know, but you know, dig that. Well, dig you know, that. Just, uh, all right. Now, let's go into a little bit with uh, your production company, Source Productions. Um, I see here that you, you were talking about earlier that you love the the uh, the Japanese uh, television commercial work that you guys have done. Are you getting into more film projects and, and all of those kinds of things, or what is it that Source Productions will be presenting forth to the globe? Uh, definitely one of our um, goals is to get into full movie score, which would be just wonderful. And, if, you know, you take a look. Actually, you can, you can see our reel on uh, LarryDunnMusic.com, I think on Luis's uh, Facebook and stuff like that. Uh, it's just, you know, we got a knack for that, so it would be wonderful. And then also, you know, I sat in with uh, my former buddies, uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, 2011 at the Consumer Electronics Show, January mm. 6th, and uh, Phillips' wheel started spinning, you know, and he's like, man, brother, man, you, you got some hands on you, man, and I said, yeah, you got a voice on you, so whatever. Uh, their manager called and said, uh, Phil and Verdeen would love it if I would grace their new single with my keyboard work, so I did, and it was Guiding Lights, and it went viral before it came out. Wow. I ran it to Verdeen at the NAMM show, and uh, the the other thing where they showcase all the instruments and whatever, and he's like, man, Larry he said, man, that that Dagum song went viral, man. It's not even out yet. He said, that's the, that's the way we're supposed to sound, and 
and a lot of blogs were out there. People, it's amazing, man. I just thank everybody. People are like, we know that's Larry. We know that's Larry on them keys. And, and so I had dinner with Phil and Verdine, and uh, we worked out something for me to come in and help them produce and write and play keys on their new album. And it's coming out. I think people are going to be very surprised that, hey, man, it's the first time that they sounded like the fire in, in quite some time. Wow. Wow. The tune right. on there that Luis and I wrote with Hiroto, that Kobayashi, that we wrote for Philip, that's just off the chain. And there's another one that Philip and I wrote uh, for Kalimba and vocals. And Ollie Willis came back in and wrote the lyrics with us. And it's, uh, it's, it's some stuff. You know, at the dinner, I told Philip and Verdine, I said, hey, man, you guys have been around a lot of musicians in the past 25 plus years, some great, some not so great. You've had top notch producers, and even they told you that. You know, for that sound, you got to get back to the formula. Right, exactly, exactly. To go back to basics now. Come on now. Well, both, both musically and spiritually. Exactly. You know, so we're doing that, and then we got you know Louisa. We're getting ready to work on her project. She's got some great stuff. She's got a single, this this funky, not funky, funky that's out now called Mayhum. M a y dash h u m m. Mayhum. Man, ooh, okay, I'm, I'm looking for it. I'm going to go find it now. M A Y dash U M M. May Oom. May Oom. And got great roots on there comparing it to James Brown because of the music and then Beyonce and Aretha Franklin. I said, like, wow. And it's, it's funky. So that's on iTunes. And uh, eventually we'll get that on the Larry Dunn music because they, they can please let them know that they can get into the journey. Uh, of course, iTunes. But if they're old school like all of us, and they want uh, a hard copy with, because we got a beautiful cover and be- it was done yes, by that Domingo and Cena. And Louisa worked with him, you know, getting everything that we wanted, and it's so nice. So if they want the hard copy, it's got liner notes. It was written by Scott Galloway, and it's got everybody's name on there and all some of the lyrics. Uh, they just go to the PayPal link on LarryDunnMusic dot com, and they get a hard copy sent right to their door. Okay, then uh, we got the PayPal link on LarryDunnMusic.com. Of course, you know, we have it up on iTunes. And where else can folks find you? If they want to reach out to you, is everything through your website? Or what? This is your opportunity now to let them have. Oh, yeah, the the LarryDunnMusic.com. And then we've got Facebook. We've got MySpace. We've got Twitter. Oh, so they could they could be fighting me. Oh yes, you can be saying that part. I am wow. I am I am I am sitting up here now. I am in such awe of you and your brilliance, honey. Well, thank just, you so much. Back at you. Just to to I, I mean number one, I wasn't expecting you to play for me. And that there is just a joy, and I thank you so much for that. Um, and also, just just to hear the instrumentation and all of that. See, I, I'm I'm old school down, honey, and I, I I'm crazy for all that, you know. And I'm I'm one who see I'm that cat that's at the concert that will go crazy because you say, okay, let me introduce you to the band, and these are my singers, and this, that, and other. Because I need to know who that bitch is on that on that on that second note right there that's screaming. <laughs> Okay, see, uh, I'm, right. I'm that one. You know, that's the kind I read a lot of those. I'm like, okay, who is this in this background over here just tickling me? And then, you know, who was beating these drums? Or who, see, I'm as a baritone bass singer, um, and then I, 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 I can rise to a second tenor. You know, when I hear all oh. that, you know, I, and learning that the bass note, honey, is my is my note, whoever on the bass. You know, I, I I listen for those things, and and then I'm improving my ear because my ear is not the best, but I'm improving my ear. So you know, when I hear this kind of stuff, it sends me into just that euphoric frenzy that I love. So I that's why I just have to call you the master of the elements, because like I said before, if you're into comic books like Thor, like Storm, honey, I call forth the wind, I call forth the earth, I call forth. And we finna make that Amen. happen, you know. Amen. And I I just 
thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for listening to the voice that guided you all these years and that continues to guide you. I thank you for incorporating your life with your wife and bringing her in and introducing the world to what artistry she has. And just just to give you the accolades, so some of the accolades that other folks may not give you on a spiritual tip, just to understand and to say, I dig it, I get it, I'm connected with it, because anything that's done in spirit is going to connect to spirit. So, yeah. So thank you for just such a, a wonderful legacy, a wonderful history, a fantastic catalog, and I am so looking forward to more and more and more and more and more. What a wonderful way to kick off my three-year anniversary, honey. I'm loving this. <laughs> the anniversary to you. So you feel you feel better now today? You feel better? Actually, you know what? Yes, I'm. I'm I, <laughs> I think I am a little mm-hmm. bit more lively. My my voice has changed a little bit. I'm I'm a little spry. You know. <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah, I, 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 I could tell you was a little. A little heightened in the beginning, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, music but, is healing. Oh, honey, I'm telling you, music will calm a savage beast, baby. Amen. Oh. Amen. <laughs> okay. You. you. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'm going to let you get back into the world known as the Dunn family and into all of the that you do. And I'm going to say thank you one more time for coming on and for gracing us with your presence. And again, like I said, for this one. Oh, my God, I'm I'm getting emotional just a little bit because it's just a wonderful, rich, rich history and and body of work. And, oh, I'm just so happy to be a part of it and and to be on this side of creation, to hear it and to enjoy it. And so, yes, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. God Thank bless. you so much. God bless you and your family. Thank you so much. We oh, love the you sweet, the kisses, honey. Kisses, 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 sweetie. Thank you and okay. love. And all the best to you and all of your endeavors and continuous success in your in your radio and and, and everything that you do. Your talent. Oh, well, bless you. I so appreciate you for that. Thank you so much. Now, you cats go ahead on and listen. Now, whatever's on the menu, unless it's seafood, because I'm allergic, honey, fax me a plate. <laughs> okay, you got it. Well, I'm sure you're going to be out here one day, so. I'm coming soon. Trust me. Okay. <laughs> and make sure, if you don't, yeah, that you get the entire disc from Mary, from Mary and Angelo. And, yeah, special thanks out to all our family at uh, Double Exposure, you know, Mary and Angelo and Emily and everybody, Mr. Angelo Ellerby. Y'all are like brothers. Brothers oh, really? from another mother, but the same father. I think we're, we're, yeah. we're probably just kindred spirits. That's all. You know, that's we're kindred funny, spirits. Man. Well, yeah, you guys, thank you so much. All right, baby, thank you so much, and you guys have a blessed day, and just continue, continue, continue to follow that which you know to be true. Amen. I hope you feel better. You take care. Thank you, baby. You too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. God bless. All righty then, ladies and gentlemen. Child, I, I, I'm telling you, honey, I, I do feel better. I'm kicking it. Wow. Music does that to me. Y'all know I get crazy. Y'all know damn well I get crazy, honey. But without that, wow! <laughs> I can't stand my own ass. But okay, that there is that. Oh, this has been a wonderful show, honey. And we got some good tidbits up in here. I thank you so much for uh, for joining us, honey, and listening to Mr. Larry Dunn. Don't you have a wonderful voice? Ooh. Okay, gonna make me go put on my my big daddy voice, okay? <laughs> but in any event, honey, thank you so much for your time and your love and your energy, honey. So uh, that there is going to be that. I'm going to sit down here. I'm going to stretch out a little bit, honey, and continue to heal today because I do have to go back to the donut factory. You know, the time to make the donuts job later on this evening. So I just want to sit back and just relax a little bit. And uh, call it grace. So if you love me, honey, tell a friend. If you hated me, honey, tell an enemy. But do know this, one way, shape, style, form, or fashion, this thing will move forward. Okay? 
Finish all of your crumpets, honey, because the tea has been dished, and you've been dishing tea, darlings, ha, with Big Meat. Honey, join us again next week on the 18th, which is my nephew's uh, 17th birthday. And also, honey, we are going to be joined by the fabulous, honey, I call him the king of the 1970s black films, Mr. Antonio Huggy Bear Fargus is going to be my guest next week. And uh, that there's going to be a dream come true for all of us. So without any further ado, honey, thank you for joining us. We are in anniversary mode, honey, for all this month as we are turning three years old as of the 1st of July. So, yes, my babies, thank you so much for your time and your love. And I'll see you again at the right time and at the right place. Ciao.